a couple of weeks ago, we began a new series. A series primarily aimed at believers in Jesus Christ. A series dealing with the subject of getting back to the basics. Getting back to the basics. And we began a couple of weeks ago by dealing with the morning watch, if you will remember. The morning watch, how that we ought to start every day with God. The importance of starting every day with God. And, and, and so we dealt with the morning watch. And then last time we talked about the daily filling, how that as believers in Jesus Christ, we are commanded we're commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. You remember we saw the three, the three glasses. There was the empty glass, which represents the natural man in the Bible. The man who, he does not know Christ as his Savior. And the Spirit of God is not dwelling in him. He's, he's just an empty man. His, his life is empty. And, and, and just, just emptiness all around. And so, and so we saw the natural man. Then we saw the carnal man. How that a person who becomes a believer in Christ, they are indwelt by the Spirit of God. And yet, sadly, so many times believers in Christ, even though the Spirit of God is living inside of them, they are still primarily full of self. They're still full of air. And so we talked about the carnal, the carnal man. And then we saw the spiritual man, the man who is totally filled. And of course, that total filling simply means, it simply means that all of self is taken out of the way. All of self is taken out of the way. Now the Spirit of God has absolute and complete control in our heart and in our lives. It simply means that we have come to a point where that we die to our own plans, we die to our own dreams, we die to our own ambitions, and we are filled with God's Spirit in that we allow Him to have absolute control in every aspect of our life. Now this morning, we're going to kind of follow up on that. We're going to kind of follow up on that. We're going to be talking, we're going to be talking about the subject of spiritual gifts, the subject of spiritual gifts. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word, for the wonderful truths that we have sung about this morning. Now as we look into Your Word, we do pray that Your Holy Spirit would lead and guide our thoughts. Lord, I pray for myself, that You would forgive me of my sin and empty me of myself. And Lord, that You would fill me with Your Holy Spirit, that I might speak clearly and plainly the message that You would have for this hour. For each one who is here, I pray that Your Spirit would have freedom and liberty to work and to move in their hearts and in their lives. And Lord, when we leave this place this morning, may we not be the same as when we came. May we be changed. May we be changed by Your amazing grace and by Your awesome power. We ask it in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen. Dealing with the subject of spiritual gifts, it is a it's a subject that is talked about much these days. Sadly, a lot of what is being said concerning spiritual gifts does not agree with what the Bible has to say. And so let's look into the Scriptures. Let's see what the Bible has to say as we deal with this subject of spiritual gifts. Notice, first of all, their introduction. The, the introduction of spiritual gifts. And, and, and as we consider their introduction, a couple of points. For, first of all, notice the giving of the gifts. The giving of the gifts. In James chapter 1 and verse number 17, James said this. He said, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no veritableness, neither shadow of turning. Now, as you look at this verse, you will immediately notice that the word gift is used two times in our English Bible. The word gift is used twice in this text, but they are actually the translation of two different Greek words. It's two different Greek words that are used here. And, and we notice that there are, first of all, there are what is called good gifts. There are the good gifts. Uh, these are those material things that the Heavenly Father gives to us that are beneficial, that are helpful to us in our physical lives. They're, they're good gifts. They're good gifts. And it's interesting that in many ways, in many ways, these good gifts are given not only to save people, but they're given to unsaved people. The, these good gifts, they're, they're, they're given to all men. In, in fact, the Lord Jesus mentions that in Matthew chapter 5, verse number 45. He maketh 
His Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. So there are some good gifts that God gives to all people. Saved, unsaved, these are the good gifts that God gives. Every good gift, it comes from God. But He also uses another expression, and it's translated perfect gift. Perfect gift. Uh, perfect gifts are those gifts that God gives, and the Holy Spirit then perfects in us who are saved, so that we might be, as we just sang about, more like Christ so that we be, might be more like Christ in our daily lives, and so that we might be more effective in our service for Christ. These are perfect gifts, the perfect gifts. And so, but I want you to notice, good gifts, perfect gifts, the giving of those gifts, it all comes, it all comes from God. Now I want you to notice the second thing as we consider an introduction to these gifts. Not only the giving of the gifts, but notice there is also the diversity of the gifts. The diversity of the gifts. In, in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 4, the Apostle Paul writes, Now there are diversities of gifts. That, the word diversity simply means there's many different kinds. Many different kinds of gifts that God gives. But, but I want you to notice, even though there's many different kinds of gifts that God gives, the source is the same. It's diversities of gifts, but it's the same Spirit of God who gives them. It's the same Spirit of God. You see, when it comes to who gets which gift, or who, which, who gets which gifts, plural, uh, when it comes to that decision, uh, the Holy Spirit is sovereign in that choosing. He is sovereign in that choosing. In fact, that's why the Apostle Paul says in, in, in chapter 12, again, down in verse number 11, he says, but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, notice it, dividing to every man severally as he will. But there are some today who will tell us, there are some today who will teach that all believers in Jesus Christ will manifest the same gifts. They will manifest the same gifts. Uh, in fact, in an online article, uh, thelivingtruthfellowship.org, okay? Don't recommend you go there, but anyway, I'm going to give you a quote from there. On that, on that website, one charismatic writer, here's what he said. He said, why should every Christian speak in tongues? Okay, now he's going to give us an answer. He's going to answer his own question. He says, a primary reason is that speaking in tongues is the only absolute proof a Christian has that he's born again and guaranteed everlasting life in paradise. Now, that is a pretty powerful statement. I mean, that is an authoritative statement. A speaking in tongues, it's the only proof that we have that we've been saved. It's the only proof that we have assurance of heaven. Now with a statement like that, a statement that is that authoritative, you, you would certainly expect he's got a proof text. He, he's got some scriptures from the Bible to back up what he is saying. You would expect that. Does he have a proof text? No, he does not. He doesn't have a proof text simply because of the fact the Apostle Paul distinctly and clearly revealed the lie of his statement. You see, here's what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 22. Tongues are for a sign. Notice it. Not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. Bottom line, all believers do not have the same spiritual gifts. All believers do not have the same spiritual gifts. In fact, the Apostle Paul again makes the point perfectly clear with a series of questions. Notice the questions that he asked. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 29 and verse 30. He says, are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Are all workers of miracles? 
Have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? These are all, these are all rhetorical questions. The answer is obviously no. We don't all have the same gifts. There are different gifts that God's Holy Spirit in His sovereignty has given to different people according to His will. And so clearly, all believers, contrary to the claims of some, do not have the same, they do not have the same gifts. But then there's a third thing that I want us to notice, and that is this, the purpose. The purpose of the gifts. The Apostle Paul, writing about spiritual gifts in Romans chapter 12, he used one of his favorite analogies for the church, and that is the human body. Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and verse number 5, he says, For as we have many members in one body, and all members have not the same office. I mean, you stop and think about it. You stop and think about it. Uh, we are, you look at your body, and, and, and there's many different members there. But they don't all do the same thing. They don't all do the same thing. You have a, you have a heart that pumps blood. You have, you have a stomach that digests food. You have, you have a liver and kidneys that purify things. You, you have ears that can hear, eyes that can see, nose that can smell, a tongue that can taste. You have all these different parts, but they don't all do the same thing. They don't all have the same office. Now he's going to make the parallel. Verse 5, so we, so we, being many, are one body in Christ. And every one members one of another. Our, our, our body has many parts. Each part has a specific purpose. It has a, it has a specific purpose that is necessary in order for our body to function as the Lord God desires and as the Lord God designed and as the Lord God created it to function. The heart doesn't just serve itself. The heart doesn't just serve itself. It's crucial to every other organ in the body. And if it stops beating, I got news for you. We will have your funeral. You're, you're dead, okay? If, it's, if it stops working, if it stops doing what God designed it to do, it's going to cause you to die. It'll cause you to die. Similarly, in the same way, every member of the church is gifted by God. Every member of the church is gifted by God in a way that is vital to the health, to the operation, to the function of the church. Every, every Christian is gifted in some way. And the matter of the fact is, if a member is not using his or her spiritual gift as God intended, then the church is going to suffer. The church will not be able to operate at full capacity. So when it comes to this thing of, uh, of spiritual gifts, we, we need to remember in 1 Corinthians 14, 12, the admonition, even so ye, for as much as, in other words, since or, or, or because ye are zealous of spiritual gifts, seek that ye may excel. In other words, seek to use your spiritual gift as God intended. For what purpose? So that you can boast and put on Facebook, here's what I've done. No, 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 no. Here's the purpose. Here's the purpose. It's so that you might edify, you might build up the church. That, that's the purpose of the spiritual gifts. The purpose of the spiritual gifts is not to give us something to boast about or to brag about. Rather, the purpose of spiritual gifts is always focused on the good and the benefit of others. The good and the benefit of others. That's the introduction. Number two, what are these spiritual gifts? Let, let, let's notice their identification. Let's notice their identification. In the passages that deal with the spiritual gifts, you will find out that there are basically two categories. When we talk about spiritual gifts, there are basically two categories that they can be divided into. First of all, there are what are called the supernatural gifts. The supernatural gifts. And as we consider these supernatural gifts, I think it's important that we go back and, and we, notice, we notice, first of all, how they are listed. The, the supernatural gifts, how are they listed? And, and the Lord Jesus Himself gives us the listing of these supernatural gifts. 
The Lord Jesus Himself gives us the listing. It's found in Mark chapter 16, right after giving the Great Commission to go into all the world, to preach the gospel to every creature. The Lord Jesus then followed that by saying this. Mark chapter 16, verse 17, verse 18. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they'll cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. That is, tongues or languages that they've never studied. Tongues, languages they've never learned. It's going to be a new tongue for them. So, so these signs are going to cast out devils. They'll speak with new tongues. Verse number 18, they'll take up serpents. Take up serpents. And, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. It might be noted that of these gifts, the one most prominent today is the gift of tongues. That's, that's the one that everybody focuses on in, in this day and age. However, however, when the actions of today are compared with the biblical examples, there's a huge difference. You see, in the Bible, the gift of tongues, it is, it is always a language that is known. And it is a language that is understood by others. For example, day of Pentecost, right? Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, verse 6 to verse number 11, on the day of Pentecost, we're told that they spoke in tongues. They spoke in tongues. And we're also told that men from 15 different nations heard in their own language the message of the gospel. These men spoke in tongues and men from other nations heard, understood exactly what was being said. They heard the message of the gospel in their own language. But today those who speak in tongues have redefined it. We have a member in our family back in the States who has become caught up in this. And she has declared how that when she speaks in tongues, her tongue is actually an ecstatic, heavenly utterance. It's an ecstatic, it's a heavenly utterance. In, in other words, she makes sounds, she's saying things that not only does nobody else understand, she doesn't even know what she's saying. And she's blaming it on the Holy Spirit. That the Holy Spirit is doing this for her. Let me just tell you something. That's the most dangerous thing. It's the most dangerous thing. Let me tell you why. Here's the reason why it's so dangerous. It's because of what Jesus said. Listen to this. Matthew chapter 12, verse number 36 and verse 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, that, 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 that idle word, it carries the idea. Words that have no meaning to you or to anybody else. They're just empty words. Okay? They're just empty words. Doesn't mean anything to you, doesn't mean anything to anybody else. Every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. For by their words they shall be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Think about that. You, you know what that tells me? According to what the Lord Jesus said, if you don't know what you're saying, you better keep your mouth shut because you're going to give an answer for it. You're, you're going to give an answer for those words that come out of your... So you better know what you're saying before you start talking. You better know what you're saying before you start talking. And the Apostle Paul, he, he sums it all up, I think, very well. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14, he said, For if I pray in an unknown tongue, that is, if I pray in a language that is unknown to the people who are with me, my spirit prays, but my understanding that is, the thing I know I am saying is unfruitful. It's of no benefit to you. In other words, I could stand up here and I could say, and none of you would understand except for maybe a few. 
하나님이 세상을 이처럼 사랑하사 독생자로 주셨으니 이런 자로 믿는 자 말함 열망치 않고 영생을 얻게 하려 하십니다. 요한복음 3장 16절 Boy, I'm blessed by How many were blessed by that? Sonny and Brother Yoon. Okay, that's all. That's, that, that's it. But, but see, we were blessed, but none of you were. You know why? You didn't understand what I was saying. But we understood it. By the way, that was John 3.16, okay? And okay, if you speak in tongues, you have to translate. Okay, here it is. For God so loved the world that He gave His own... Right? Okay, you get the idea. That's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying. It's exactly what the Apostle Paul is saying. If I pray in an unknown tongue, I know what it is, but nobody else knows. Then I'm praying to myself. And though it blesses me, it really, it really is of no spiritual benefit to anybody else. Of no spiritual benefit to anybody else. While the, while the Holy Spirit certainly, certainly speaks for us. Get this now, this is important. He speaks for us to God the Father with words that we cannot utter. Romans chapter 8, verse number 26. He will never lead us to say anything that we don't understand. He may speak for us with a language that we cannot utter. But He'll never lead us to say anything that we cannot understand. And so when it comes to this matter, when it comes to this matter of the supernatural gifts, we see the listing. But then also I want you to notice an important point, and that is this, their function. What, what's the purpose of these gifts? What, what's the purpose of these supernatural gifts that God has given? And, and there's a twofold function. First of all, it is to confirm God's man. It's to confirm God's man. You remember in Acts chapter 2, Peter on the day of Pentecost. He, he's preaching there on the day of Pentecost. And here's what he said. Acts chapter 2, verse 22. He said, Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man, notice it, a man approved of God among you. And how was he approved? How did God show that Jesus Christ was truly who He claimed to be? Here it is. By miracles and wonders and signs which God did by Him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. In the same way, when the apostles came to doing some amazing things that the Lord Jesus had done, when they began to heal the sick and they began to speak in tongues and all of those things, people would know by the things that they were doing, these are truly men of God. These are God's men. These are God's messengers. So the purpose of the miracles and the signs was to confirm God's man, but also it was to confirm God's message. It's to confirm God's message. When the Apostle Paul, or the Apostles rather in general, when the Apostles began preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, it, it was a message that in the ear of the common people, it, it was a message that simply did not ring true. Okay? I mean, stop and think about it. What is the message of the gospel? That the Creator of all things became a man. Never heard of such a thing like that in their whole life doesn't ring true in the ear of the natural man. Uh, they begin preaching that He came into this world, this Creator who came in, He came through the womb of a virgin. What? Never heard of such a thing. Doesn't ring true. Doesn't ring true. <laughs> that He was perfect. He was sinless. Never told a lie. Never took anything that did not belong to Him. Never had a wicked, selfish motivation for anything that he did. He was sinless. He was perfect. And, and yet he dies the death of a common criminal. That just doesn't make sense. That just doesn't make sense. Doesn't ring true to the natural ear. They also came declaring that uh, after he's crucified, he's buried. And guess what? After three days and three nights, he rose again from the dead. He's now ascended back into heaven. He's seated at the right hand of God the Father, and one day he's going to come back again. That sounds like a fairy tale. Doesn't ring true. Doesn't ring true to the eyes of the natural man. And to prove that these men of God, 
were declaring a message that was absolutely true. That was the purpose for the signs. In fact, listen to what it says. In Mark chapter 16, after listing the signs and the wonders that are given, Mark chapter 16, verse 20, notice what it says. It says, they went forth. That These apostles, they went forth, preached everywhere, the Lord working with them, and notice it, confirming the Word. Proving that their message is true. And how did He do it? With the signs that we're following. Amen. There's another thing that we notice here concerning these supernatural gifts. And that is their passing. Their passing. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 31, the Apostle Paul says, covet earnestly the best gifts. The best gifts. The, the, the idea in that word simply means gifts that that are going to endure. Gifts that are, that are going to be ongoing. Those are the kind of gifts that we ought to covet. Those are the gifts that we ought to desire. Uh, bottom line, the sign gifts are never intended to be permanent. They're never intended to be permanent. In fact, the Apostle Paul in, his, in the love chapter, right? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, here's what he said. He said, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, they're going to fail. Okay? Whether there be tongues, they're going to cease. And whether there be knowledge, it's going to vanish away. Now the question immediately comes to mind, when is all of this going to happen? When are these sign gifts, these supernatural gifts, when are they going to pass away? When are they going to cease to be? And the answer is given in verse 9 and verse number 10. For we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. Immediately now we have to ask the question, well, what is the perfect thing? What is the perfect thing that is to come? Well, it's obviously something that is going to give us, it's going to give us full knowledge. It's going to give us full prophecy. Full knowledge, full prophecy. You remember the Apostle Paul wrote these words. He, he wrote these words when the New Testament epistles are still being written. That's an important historical point. When, when he wrote this, the New Testament epistles are still being written. When he wrote this, the the Apostle John had not yet written that book of prophecy, the book of Revelation. That, that would come sometime later. And, and so therefore, God's knowledge for this age, His plan for the ages to come, were still in the process of being revealed when the Apostle Paul said, when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part is going to be done away with. And it's interesting to note, by the time you come to the end of the book of Acts, those supernatural gifts are already fading. The supernatural gifts are already fading. And in the apostles, in the epistles, not the apostles, the epistles. In the epistles, it's interesting that the supernatural gifts are not even mentioned. Except in Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, where he is correcting them because they were abusing and misusing the spiritual gifts. It's the only time they're mentioned. It's the only time they're mentioned. So, but now, since we have the Word of God, we, we, we have this Bible. This is God's complete revelation. Everything God wants us to know in this age, He's given it to us. It's in this book. And in this book, we can see God's perfect plan for all of the ages. We find that. We find that in this book. And because God has revealed to us everything that we need to know in this day and in this age in which we live, there is no need for spiritual, supernatural I should say, no need for supernatural gifts today. We can know. We can know if a man is a man of God or not. We can know that. You know how we know? We listen to what he says and then we compare it to what the Bible says. We, we can know what God's plan for the future is. How do we know? We, we, because the Bible reveals it to us. He tells us what is coming. He tells us what we can look forward to. We can know that God's man, we can know that God's message is actually from God as we use the Word of God. 
Supernatural gifts. There's also natural gifts. Natural gifts. In, in those passages dealing with the supernatural gifts, it is interesting that you find some natural gifts. You actually find some talents that are kind of mixed in. They're, they're mixed in, and, and, and it's amazing that these natural talents are talents, they're abilities that can even be saved in or be seen in unsaved men. Uh, for, for example, in Romans chapter 12, verse number 7, we, we find the gift of teaching. The gift of teaching is mentioned. Now, growing up and going to school, I had some teachers who were... See, how can I put this nicely? They were so boring. They could put a typhoon to sleep. I mean, that would, they would bore the paint off the wall. But I had some other teachers. I had some other teachers who, even, even, they weren't Christians. They weren't Christians at all. But even though they weren't Christians, they, they had a gift. They had a talent for teaching. They, they, instilled, they instilled in me a, a, a love for studying, a love, an interest in, in, in studying and learning. And, and so they, 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 were, they were a great influence. Unsaved, yes, but they had this gift of teaching. They had a gift of teaching. You also find in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, there's the gift of exhorting. The gift of exhorting. And I, I, I've met people, I've, I've read the books about people who, they, they don't know Christ, they're not believers, they're, they're not Christians at all, and, and yet they have, they have been seen as very, as people who are gifted motivators. They're gifted motivators. They have a real gift for, for, for in encouraging people to take positive actions in their lives. They encourage people to make life-changing decisions that are going to be beneficial for them throughout the rest of their life. These are truly gifted people, gifted in exhorting, encouraging people to take action. Romans chapter 12, verse 8, we talk about the gift of giving. The gift of giving is mentioned, and we've all heard about those entrepreneurs and even though they are not believers in Christ, they've never trusted in Christ as their Savior. In fact, many of them may even be atheistic in their, in their faith. Uh, and yet even these men, even these men are gifted with the spirit of generosity. And, and therefore, as a result of that, they, they give huge sums of money. They give huge sums of money to, to worthy causes, to, to humanitarian causes. The, the gift of giving. There's also in Romans chapter 12, verse 8, there's the gift of ruling. The gift of ruling. And we've all heard about people in, in the business world. We've heard about people in the political world. People who, even though they are not saved, they're not believers in Christ, yet they are gifted with leadership abilities. They're gifted with leadership skills in administration that, that results in order. It results in efficiency. It results in a prosperity. Not only for them, but for those who, who are with them. Those who work for them. Gift of ruling. In Romans chapter 12, verse 8, we also find the gift of mercy. The gift of mercy. Romans chapter 12, verse 8, we've all heard of those people who, e even though they're not Christians, they've never been saved, yet they are the kind of people, they're the kind of people, they are always quick to show compassion. They're, they're always quick to show compassion. They're very quick to give their help to those who are suffering, whether it's suffering emotionally or physically or financially. The, these are people who have this gift of mercy who are always willing to give a helping hand. Whether they're saved or lost, we, we know people that way. We know people that way. Bottom line, bottom line, the natural gifts, these natural talents, that God has given to every one of us. Every one of us. These natural gifts and these natural talents are listed with the supernatural gift. Which raises a question, why? Why are they included in that list of the supernatural gifts? And the reason is simply because of the fact, please listen very carefully, 
the natural gifts, those natural talents that God has given to every person, those gifts become spiritual gifts when they are surrendered to the total control of God's Holy Spirit. When we surrender our gifts to His control and we allow Him, then those gifts are used by God to bring honor and glory to His name. Natural talents, natural gifts can become spiritual gifts. When we, as that song that we sang earlier, when we put it all on the altar, and we allow Him to have absolute control. Has God given to you a gift, a talent? Absolutely, yes. Every one of us here this morning, we have gifts, we have talents that God has blessed us with. We have abilities that God has given to us. But my question this morning is this, are you wasting what God gave you? By the way, I'm talking to Christians. I'm not talking to the unsaved. I'm talking to Christians. Are you wasting? Are you wasting your gift? Using it to fulfill your own worldly ambition, your own selfish desires? Or have you surrendered those talents, those abilities that God has given to you? Have you surrendered them to His control that they might become spiritual gifts that will be useful to the edifying of God's church? They'll be edifying to other people. They'll be something that will help others. As the song says, they will cause others to see Jesus in us. How are you using? How are you using your talents? How are you using your abilities that God has given to you? May God help us each and every one to surrender those talents, surrender those abilities to God's control, that He might turn those natural things into supernatural things that only He can use in ways that go far beyond what we could ever hope or what we could ever imagine. Heavenly Father, we thank You this morning for Your Word. Lord, as we consider this most basic principle, the basic principle of not only being filled with your Spirit as we saw last time, but this principle of surrendering our, our talents, our abilities that you've given to us. Surrendering them to you that they might be used by you for the good, the edification of others, for the glorifying of your most precious name. Lord, I pray this morning, your will would be done in each heart and in each life. May this truly be a day of service, a day of rededication. Ask in Jesus' name and for Jesus' sake. Amen.